Hello, this is author, blogger, producer, and podcaster Bobby Osinski. You're listening to the Your Morning Coffee podcast with my friends Jay Gilbert and Michael Etchart. Weekly music news for the new music business. For music business worldwide, Spotify has 44.4 million U.S. subscribers in February. Apple Music had 32.6 million, according to new data. From Bobby Osinski at Music 3.0, let's bust the 10 biggest AI music myths. And from the Wall Street Journal, how to succeed in business like Taylor Swift. (laughs) <laughs> that is information that I need to know. Me Jay. too. I really need to know how to succeed in business. Is she successful? I, I, Apparently, I been I've been told up. that she she has like a, okay. a very small but nice house okay. somewhere. Yeah, kids got exactly. a shot. Exactly. Well, okay. well, kids got a shot. Exactly. All right. These stories and more. <laughs> Jay and I are going to jump in right about now. Stand by for transmission. This is London calling. Wake up. Your morning coffee is on the air. Your morning coffee, the weekly music news for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. And now from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Jay, it is so good to see you on a summer su- uh, summer Saturday. I summer Saturday, summer beautiful Sunday, day outside. Yeah. Uh, it is indeed. Every it day is above indeed. ground is a good day, my friend. It is indeed, and what a what a what a fun! Uh, we have many fun stories to talk about oh. today. I'm really excited to jump in. Yeah, and, lots uh, going on, right? Yeah, and what I really like about certain stories is when you kind of pull the curtain back and you get some information that you didn't have before, mm-hmm. and you know we we both are kind of geeks about stuff like that, yeah. And, there, these these stories are really that today. So I, I just love that. I, I love learn that. stuff every single week in the newsletter, the podcast, you know, and that's the beautiful thing about you and I is we're just super curious dudes and we love learning this stuff. And look, it's evolving and changing. So what's accurate today may not be accurate next month, but uh, so many great things to talk about. But before we jump into the stories, we had an incredible conversation with uh, Jamie Marconette from Luminate, and we can't mm-hmm. really tell you much about it, but we can tell you there's a special episode that's going to be dropping soon, and we are just thrilled to collaborate with Luminate and with Jamie. Uh, that was fun. Oh, it was very fun. And, you know, like, I think, was it last week we started talking about this? It's really the golden age of data. Yeah. And, and, and we were there at the beginning of that golden age, which was back in 1991 for yeah. SoundScan and BDS. And, um, you know, and, and even when we look at all of the stories we talk about week after week after week from all the different outlets... And, you know, you, you remember in the early days of when we got in the business, there was Billboard, of course. Mm-hmm. There were a handful of other trade magazines. Do you remember the Velvet ton. Rope? Of course I remember the Velvet Rope. That was the first sort of online kind of, I would not going to say snarky, but it was really kind of, it was uh, like, you know, kind of insider yes. stuff, some gossipy, and, and it was fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. What was, yeah. The, what was the gal's name that did the Velvet Rope? I don't remember, uh, but it was one of my favorite places to sort of, you know, go in. And now you have the pho list, you know, which is mm-hmm. awesome uh, to follow. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, again, I, I don't know if we mentioned this, 
We've got a couple of, well, a few special episodes that are just dropping in between our regular episodes. And the one that uh, dropped last week, you and I sat down with our our friend and colleague, Chris Castle. So we talked about that last week, but now it's live. So if you go look in your feed, you'll see our special interview with Chris Castle. Don't miss it. Um, it's, it's really good. And, uh, we've got, uh, the Will Page is going to be dropping pretty soon. And then of course the one that you and I just talked about with, uh, Jamie and Luminate can't wait. Uh, really great stuff. No. And these are, you know, in the, in the format that we have for the regular show, um, there's not a lot of time for us to, to bring in other guests to have extended conversations. So these special, uh, episodes are just that extended yeah. conversations, which is, and it's fun to go deep sometimes. Yeah, and it sure is all the time. Actually, it's fun to go deep. So those are, that is what they are. And big thanks to Bobby Osinski for giving us the intro. Yes, because Bobby we're be talking about uh, an article with him today. And as we've mentioned before, he is, uh, a very sharp cookie and also one of the people out there that really knows the entire kind of spectrum of music in terms He's of the creation. He's a unicorn. And the There's not many really people is. that know production, engineer, you know, all the way through the studio process and then the music business, you know, and exactly. record companies and distributors and, you know, AI. And he's a, a producer, engineer, producer engineer himself. He's a blogger. He's written 24 books on recording music. So I uh, can't wait to, uh, to jump into his uh, piece this week, but he's a fantastic resource. Uh, resource. Check out music3.0.com. Uh, and yeah. thank you, Bobby, for that website. intro. Yes, absolutely. And you actually interviewed one of my, a big, uh, an artist that I am a big fan of uh, for, for your Behind the Set List podcast, Grace Potter. Yeah, we had such a great conversation uh, with Grace. Uh, her new album is so good. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, soon. Um, but she is a road dog. She's been playing, you know, for decades uh, on the road. She's so good. The new album is so good. And we just, we sort of had a, you know, one of those moments when you meet someone and you have a lot in common and you start talking about things where you forget that you're recording. And so Glenn Peoples and I, you know, for the behind the set list podcast, we had one of those rare conversations where it didn't feel like the press talking to a subject. It, it was like you and I, it was just a couple of music geeks going, dude, did you hear that thing? Right. It was a lot more like that. And at the end of it, you know, we, we did it over zoom, but if she was in the room, I would have given her a big hug. There you go. Well, she is such a fantastic Hammond organ player and a singer and oh, really great. Hey, by the way, we do need to thank our sponsors because we are so appreciative of the folks that help us put the show on every week, including HypeBot. Since 2004, HypeBot has chronicled the new music industry and the trends and technologies that are changing how music is discovered, consumed, marketed, and monetized. It is edited daily by founder Bruce Houghton with help from Alana Bonilla. HypeBot and sister blog Music Think Tank are published by Live Music Discovery and Marketing platform Bands in Town. And a special thanks to Bands in Town. Over 74 million live music fans trust Bands in Town to get personalized concert alerts, recommendations, and messages from their favorite artists. It's the number one artist services platform connecting over 560,000 artists with their super fans. Managers, labels, agencies, and artists access their own dashboard to manage and promote their tour dates across all platforms. Indeed. And how about Music Business Association? The Music Business Association creates the rooms in which the important conversations that shape our industry's future take place. We know when we work together, our industry, your business, and your people will be stronger. Our membership represents every major segment of the global music business, including labels and distributors, music streaming, retail and wholesale, publishers and pros, rights management and metadata, artist managers, tech and startups. Big thanks to the Music Business Association. Jump over to musicbiz.org for more information. So we do thank yeah. the Music Business Association, Hypebot and Bands in Town. And I also thank the 33rd hardest working man in show business, my brother, That's Jay me. Gilbert, music industry consultant, curator of the weekly Your Morning Coffee newsletter and former executive with Universal, Sony, and Warner Music Groups. Uh, and yes. just a handsome lad. Oh, thank you so much. And, and I am so honored to get to do this 
um, podcast every week with my good friend, Mike Etchart, longtime host of Sound and Vision Radio, formerly of SST Records, Warner Music, Capital EMI, and Universal Music Groups. And he opened for the Gin Blossoms last week. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. How did that go, by the way? It was fun. Nice. It's always fun to get up on stage and play a little music for an appreciative audience. Yeah. So, very cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, that was super cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course. Well, hey, a bunch of stuff going on before we even get to our stories. Uh, how about uh, Meta and this new little app, little app called Threads? <laughs> oh, I hadn't heard. No, this uh, Threads, you know, which is really a kind of, they're calling it the Twitter killer it's crazy over now this is 12 hours ago they had over 70 million signups right so wow. if you don't know threads is owned by the company meta you know which is the that's facebook instagram that's all under meta instagram has more than 2 billion users far more than the 238 million users twitter reported having in months before elon musk took over uh, when new users sign up for threads which they do using an Instagram account, the app prompts them to follow all of their existing Instagram contacts with a single tap. It's optional, I did it, but it's easy to accept and it takes a conscious decision to decline. So they're sort of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants there. Indeed, by promoting threads through Instagram and by sharing Instagram user data with threads to let people instantly recreate their social networks, Meta has significantly greased the onboarding process. That frictionless experience has allowed threads to leapfrog what's known in the industry as the cold start problem, in which a new platform struggles to gain new users because there are no other users there to attract them. Yeah. 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 There was a really great piece the Associated Press um, put out, and the headline was, Clone or Competitor? Users and Lawyers Compare Twitter and Threads. Uh, that was by Matt O'Brien and Wyatt Grantham Phillips uh, over at AP. So just how similar is Instagram's chatty new app Threads to Twitter? Well, in a cease and desist letter <laughs> earlier this week, Twitter threatened legal action against Instagram parent company Meta over the new text-based app Threads, which it called shockingly, a copycat. No. Uh, in quotation marks, the industry has a storied past of borrowing ideas from each other, said Alexandra Popkin, Twitter's uh, former head of trust and safety operations, adding that threads and other platforms such as Mastodon and Blue Sky are trying to capitalize on what is demand for a suitable, safer alternative to Twitter. Yeah, but one difference, she said, uh, will likely be the people who use it at threads quote, you're essentially taking your audience from Instagram and putting this into a new text based app. Whereas Twitter is kind of a niche audience for politicians, celebrities and news junkies. Uh, she said, sure. So meta has long been criticized for its market dominance and for allegedly trying to choke off competition by copying and killing rival applications. Now, some competition experts and even some threads users worry that if the new apps traction continues, it may simply lead to the accumulation of even more power and dominance for meta and its CEO, Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. So there will be a ton of conversation about Threads over threads. the next several days, weeks, months. Yeah. yeah. Lots of... Uh, Have you played with it yet? Have you jumped in there? No. I wasn't even... To be honest, I wasn't really even... I mean, I kind of remember reading that's going to happen or well, hearing about it. Well, it's only been... I mean, again, we talk about this all the time. Don't feel stupid if you haven't played with it because it's been around like five minutes. Um, yeah. As we're recording this, it's been around a little over 48 hours. And I had signed up for it. Got, got notified. I, you know, linked up my Instagram and immediately, you know, I'm starting, uh, you know, chatting with some of my friends in there and just seeing what, what's up. It's got very limited functionality because this is sort of version 1.0, that Silicon yeah. Valley model of doing business. I'm sure over the coming months and years, there's going to be uh, a lot more functionality, but right now it's pretty bare bones. But a couple of things that I noticed just really quickly before we move into the stories is that the video quality looked uh, really good, like better than most platforms. I'm not really sure why. 
And it just seemed like it was a really clean interface. I uh, didn't see any ads, you know, that sort of thing. So again, this is the beginning, but it's really surprising. And it's so difficult, as you mentioned, to grow a new platform from that cold yes. start thing. But if, if you can just build into that Instagram audience, I mean, they are off and running. It'll be fun to watch how this goes. Well, and that was brilliant to use that leverage of Instagram to yeah. to do it. And uh, I mean, I, I I can't imagine it not being successful, and I also can't imagine it not being sued in some manner, shape, or form. But yeah. boy, oh boy, oh boy, off to a, an unbelievable start. Yeah. So. Good stuff. Well, hey, what do you say uh, we jump into some of the stories, Jay? Because yeah. Because there is some really interesting stuff here. The first one from Music Business Worldwide. Spotify had 44.4 million U.S. subscribers in February. Mu- uh, Apple Music had 32.6 million, according to new data. And like we said, we just love hearing and learning about certain things. And this article was not, uh, was fantastic. It's from Murray Stassen. Oh yeah. He's great. And he is great over there. And you know, a lot of these numbers were kind of mysterious, uh, or unknown, I should say really at the time. And it says, you know, the, the article starts by saying, we know that at the close of Q1 of 2023, uh, that's the three months to the end of March, Spotify had a total glo- Spotify had a total global paying subscription audience of 210 million. Now that number was revealed as part of the company's Q1 earnings results in which Spotify told investors that added 5 million net premium subscribers during the quarter. Now, this is Music Business Worldwide saying we've learned how many subs Spotify has as of February 2023 in one particular music market the world's largest. So in February, the U.S., in the U.S., Spotify counted 44.4 million paying subscribers. And this was, by the way, this figure was revealed at the annual meeting of the National Music Publishers Association, the NMPA, in New York last month by NMPA CEO and President David Israelite. Yeah. And just so we're clear, um, because there's a lot of numbers being thrown out here, that, you know, Spotify told investors that they added... 5 million net premium subscribers during Q1. Mm-hmm. They added 5 million net. Okay, that's that's great. <clears throat> what you're talking about here is that Spotify counted 44.4 million paying subscribers in aggregate in in the United States. And I want right. to just sort of, you know, yes. point that out, you know. So David Israelite, you know, he talked about this at a June 14th event, you know, for the first time that the NMPA Uh, the National Music Publishers Association, was able to determine the number of subscribers each platform achieved in the U.S. And he said, this is the information that has not been made public. Some of these companies report on their subscribers, some don't. So amongst the stats revealed by David Israelite, you know, and and MPA, was that Spotify rival Apple Music Um, had 32.6 million subscribers in the U.S. in the month of February, making it the market's second biggest subscription music service. So a lot of these figures aren't really easy to get. We don't always see these Apple numbers. No, as they say, Apple Music has historically revealed little about how many subscribers are paying to stream music on its platform. Now, they did confirm back in June of 2019 that Apple Music had passed the milestone of 60 million global subscribers. That was four no years offici- ago. Four years ago. No official figures have been released since then. So the business of apps estimates that Apple Music has 88 million global subscribers as of June of 2022. Which again, uh, that's that's a year global. ago. And let's yes. and let's talk about Amazon Music, right? It was revealed mm-hmm. by Israelite that, you know, they're the third largest subscription music streaming service in the US with 29.3 million subscribers. That is really impressive. That is, yes. you know, like less than 3 million less than Apple Music has. So that's, you know, they're a, you know, a competitor. 
Yes, absolutely. And and in, in fact, there's a great chart in this article. Uh, it's the February 2023 subscribers by DSP. As we said, Spotify at 44.4 million, Apple Music at 32.6, Amazon Music 29.3 million, YouTube at 8.5 million. But again, that's, that's subscription to YouTube and Pandora at 2.4 million. Again, subscription. Yeah, not let me, necessarily let me just add to that, that YouTube is YouTube Music and as you mentioned, is a paid subscription. So that's why it's 8.5 million because YouTube is a beast. And Pandora mm-hmm. has 2.4 million, but they're the only DSP on this chart that's US only. Right, exactly. Um, so one of the things that, that I thought was kind of interesting to it says, in addition to these subscriber stats, at the NMPA's uh, annual meeting, which took place on June 14th, David Israelite revealed what he says was a very significant announcement about two of these services. And this is where the article gets really interesting. According to Israelite, when Amazon and Apple raised their subscription prices, not only did they not lose subscribers, they experienced subscriber growth. Well, let's talk about that for a second because you and I have been covering this a lot lately that, you know, um, it's, there's announcements all the time of DSPs raising their rates. And we've talked about how important that is and how it's, you know, underpriced. And the fear was that you would lose subscribers. But as you just pointed out, they experienced subscriber growth when they raise their rates. Exactly. Well, and we've talked, of course, about the difference between the video subscription services, the Netflixes of the world, how they are not the least bit shy of raising their rates. And nothing really, for the most part, seems to happen. And yet, for some reason, the music services are so timid about doing this and so worried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You'll recall that in Q4 of last year, Apple Music announced that it was upping its standard monthly monthly subscription prices here in the U.S. from $9.99 to $10.99. Uh, and then in January, Amazon Music confirmed to its customers that like Apple, it would be raising its standard individual Amazon Music unlimited monthly subscription price here in the U.S. from $9.99 to $10.99 also. Yeah. And so so he said the fact that both services saw growth after raising their prices in the States shows that music continues to be undervalued in the pricing by digital music services. We have a long way to go, but I am hopeful that this new information will be the encouragement that the industry needs to get pricing where it should be. Yeah, that's really, really encouraging. Uh, great piece by uh, Murray Stassen. Um, I, I'm surprised a little bit. I thought there might be a little bit more of that um, slowdown because we've talked mm-hmm. about the slowdown um, in music streaming, but we're actually seeing the opposite. Um, and it's, it's a great value. You know, if you think about it, to have access to over a hundred million tracks. And the last thing I'll say on this piece is there was another story in music business worldwide. That's in your morning coffee, the newsletter, this, uh, this last week, and the headline was Tidal to become latest music streaming platform to raise subscription prices. So it's, it's happening, and we've talked about this for a while, but it seems like uh, these DSPs are now not afraid to be the first or second or third to step out to do this because they're seeing that it's not harming their business. No, no, no. And again, it's the timidity, for lack of a better, you know, uh, a great phrase word. or word. Yeah, it is is just kind of crazy. And you know, it, it, we've talked about this before. The at that nine ninety nine price was the same price it was like almost ten years ago, and it's just mind mind blowing that it still has remained that. Whereas nothing else in 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 anything that consumers buy has had that same sort of. Uh, frozen price. Yeah. And these are small so, increases too, you know, a dollar yeah. here, a dollar there. Um, so, and, and by the way, if we can plug our Chris Castle special episode, there's a section in there where we talk about what happens when you raise rates um, for these DSPs. So I won't, mm-hmm. I won't do a spoiler, but uh, check out that interview. Uh, it's super interesting. Yeah, exactly. All right, on to our next story. Of course, we've been talking just a little bit about AI, Jay, just a little bit. Uh, Hmm. It's been in the news just a little bit, but this is a great piece from Bobby Osinski over at Music 3.0. Let's bust the 10 biggest AI music myths. Uh, This is such a great piece. Um, 
because there's a lot of information and a lot of misinformation. And, you know, we talk about it almost every day because AI is hot on everybody's mind. And as Bobby points out, and and we'll go through, you know, each one of these uh, 10 biggest AI myths uh, that he put together. He said that there's a lot of misconceptions about AI music, mostly because of the clickbait headlines about AI that one sees almost every day. After working with more than a hundred AI apps, plugins, and platforms, There are a number of things that I've learned that definitely bust some of the AI music myths that you might have. So here we go. All right. So uh, starting at number one, AI, this is a myth. AI is going to take my job as an artist, musician, producer, and songwriter. (laughs) And Bobby says, maybe if you're pretty mediocre at what you do, it can. But if you're even competent at all, you're going to beat its results every time. As of now, AI is a great tool for helping you do do music or, uh, I'm sorry, to do a music or audio job better and faster. But sometimes it doesn't even do that as it may require massive amounts of tweaking. Yeah. And number two is AI is going to usurp my creativity. AI is really nothing more than a smart calculator. Text wise, if you give it two words, it's going to provide an educated guess at what normally should come next. The same goes for a series of melody notes or a chord pattern. Think of it as a term paper in school. If you turn in a blank page, you get an F. Ask AI to write it and it will get a C or a B minus. It still needs you for it to get an A. Yeah. He says, number three, another myth. All I have to do is type a simple prompt and I'll get brilliant music with a keystroke. And Bobby says, well, it doesn't work that way. All of those great examples that you hear online have taken many hours of tweaking to get to the end result that you hear. It's been estimated that less than 10% of the music generated is usable. Ooh, I hadn't heard that. That's great. Uh, Those Drake, John Lennon, Michael Jackson, Ariana Grande tracks, you know, they're going to take over streaming networks. That's myth number four. Have you heard the audio quality of these? (laughs) They may fool a consumer, but a music pro will reject them every time. It's listenable at best, but not even to a barely acceptable pro level. And you know what? Because of the computer horsepower involved in generating AI music, that's probably not going to change for some time. He also goes on at number five, I can immediately use any AI generated song on Spotify, YouTube, or any streaming platform. And Bobby says, nope, not even close. Just about every streaming platform will now will reject a 100% or near 100% AI generated track. Even TuneCore will reject it. And by the way, you can't copyright it thanks to a recent U.S. copyright board ruling or win a Grammy with it. That's right. Number six, I can download the AI-generated tracks directly into my D, uh, digital audio workstation, DAW. He says, maybe, but here again, we have that pesky audio quality issue once more. The very best resolution you can get is 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit, uh, at some AIs. But you'll still have to pay for that privilege. So maybe as much as $99 a month. You can download a MIDI file and work from that, though. Sure. Yeah, those MIDI files. There's a ton of MIDI file libraries. Uh, Number seven is I can use an AI generated track behind my YouTube or TikTok video. And he says, maybe. Again, certain AI platforms have restrictions on where you can legally post a track they generate. Again, it comes down to payment. You get fewer restrictions the more you pay. That's right. And number eight, I automatically own the copyright on an AI generated track. Uh, He says, usually no. Once again, many AI music generation platforms have restrictions on who actually owns the copyright. You can own it or at least control it if you pay for the privilege. But it doesn't happen automatically. Many platforms, in fact, state that you cannot use the output on social media. And I would just interject. It really depends on, you know, this generative AI and what it's drawing from, because AI can't comp- it can't construct something out of nothing. And if it's drawing on public domain stuff, that's one thing. But if it's drawing on copywritten material, um, somebody's body of work, that can be detected and that's not allowed. 
Right. So uh, if you're familiar with plugins that are that are in digital audio workstations, uh, and maybe you've worked on chat GBT, I think there is a myth out there that AI audio plugins operate the same as text based AIs like chat BT, chat GPT. And he says, no, they're not as sophisticated when it comes to the user interface. In most cases, they're just a learn button that analyzes the audio and comes up with the settings. In some AI plugins, all the AI is under the hood and how the tone is replicated and there are no AI UI features. Yeah. And the last one, AI is moving so fast that whatever I learn now will be outdated next week. And Bobby says it's it's moving fast, you know, for sure, but not so much in the music world. Uh, many AI music generators are super deep with a long learning curve, and any improvement should make them hopefully simpler to use. Whatever you learn about it today is just knowledge that you'll build upon tomorrow. And I just like to add that we've been, you and I have been talking about uh, these things like Holly Herndon and her Holly mm-hmm. Plus and the company never before heard sounds. And if you haven't watched the Holly Herndon TED Talk, um, Google it, it's on YouTube, it's short, it will blow your mind. And it'll show you what the high end, I mean, because Holly Herndon, you know, she has a degree in, you know, computer science, you know, a master's degree, as well as being a very talented singer, songwriter. And so she's worked with this company, never before heard sounds. And they've created something that is really on another level than what Bobby's talking about, because a lot of these platforms that he's talking about, I've explored a lot of them and created, you know, voices of celebrities and songs from, you know, uh, different platforms. And he's absolutely right with his assessment there. Well, and if you if you follow the article in the newsletter, he's got Bobby in his article has a, an AI music cheat sheet uh, that you can download that kind of talks about some of the things that he's worked with and give you a little heads up and let you take it for a spin and see if it's worthwhile. But uh, I don't think that uh, it's like he said, it's pretty complex. And to get it to do what you want it to do is not something that's very simple. So a really yeah. good piece by Bobby. Yeah, and it great job. clears everything up. So, yeah. All right. The next one, too. Another fascinating story uh, from the Wall Street Journal, Jay. How to succeed in business like Taylor Swift. Oh, my gosh. And, such uh, a great piece. Oh, boy. There is uh, not one among us who doesn't want to be as successful as Taylor Swift is. But, um, you know, and, and she has really... Uh, well, well, we'll get to it when we when we get to the article. We'll, we'll, I'll talk about some of the things I was going to mention here. But it's fascinating. This is by Ann Steele, mm-hmm. and uh, of course, she as 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 the article starts at 33 years old. And thanks to my good friend Sam Gay for reminding me because last last week in the episode I forgot how old Taylor Swift was. I thought she might still be in her late 20s, but uh, Sam reminded me in a text afterwards All that right. she's 33. In fact, as the article states, she has outmaneuvered music executives executives vying to control her song rights, sparred with tech giants and sold record numbers of albums. She secured her fans' loyalty by speaking directly to them online before it was a marketing strategy. Yeah. Yeah. It goes on, when sales to her current uh, concert tour caused a Ticketmaster meltdown, a bipartisan Senate committee discussed whether the entire live events industry needed an overhaul. Her era's tour is forecast to be the biggest concert tour of all time with the potential to grow over a billion dollars. Yeah, I mean, Elton John just announced that his was 900 million and she hasn't crossed that yet. He's still kind of the industry leader, but it looks like, you know, she's going to be the the number one uh, touring artist or at least have the number one tour. And what I've found fascinating about Taylor Swift is that she speaks her mind um, Mm -hmm. and she... You know, she's super smart. And what this article points out is this isn't by accident. It's, it's by design. So let's, let's take a look at, you know, again, the headline is how to, how to succeed in business like, uh, like Taylor Swift. Let's take a look at some of the ways that she succeeds in business. The first one is keep your inner circle small. While many performers in the music industry hand business operations to outsiders, Swift remains actively involved. She keeps her employee base small, so her business is close, you know, with a handful of confidants that uh, include her parents, you know, according to people familiar with Swift's operations. 
you know, um, she doesn't really go for outside managers, agents, and lawyers. You know, she prefers otherwise, you know, that they take cuts of her business. So her company, 13 Management, operates out of her private jets hangar in Nashville, Tennessee. So keep your inner <laughs> circle small. And that is really good advice. Absolutely. And the, the next one is do the spade work or the shovel work. At age 11, while her mother and younger brother waited in the car, Swift went door to door asking Nashville record labels to listen to her CDs of karaoke songs. When that didn't draw interest, she picked up a 12 string guitar practicing for hours every day. She also started writing songs. Two years later, her original songs helped her secure a development deal with RCA Records. Man, that is really great advice. Um, as my grandfather used to say, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And yes. she's worked her ass off. So her success didn't come because of luck. And yeah, there are, you know, there, there are some, uh, some, there is some luck involved in any aspect of the music industry, but a majority of it is just hard work. The next one is seize the moment. Right Before releasing an album, new country music acts typically make a grueling journey across the U.S. to play for some 200 radio stations whose ratings contribute to industry charts, hopping to get, or hopping, <laughs> hoping to get airtime for their first singles. If the song gains momentum, it, it moves to heavy rotation, climbs the charts, prompting the label to put out the rest of the album. That process can be demoralizing. And many artists, they don't handle it well. Um, and that, that was said by Rick Barker, who took Swift on the first leg of her 2006 radio tour ahead of her debut. Um, so, you know, it can be really tough taking, you know, just going out and visiting all these radio stations and shaking hands and meeting people and playing for them acoustically in the studio. And it's a lot. It is a lot. And we've both worked with artists over the years that were really good or really bad at it. And, you know, you really do kind of have to um, kind of check your ego at the door and, and, and kind of put your, your humanity on display a lot of times. And uh, I, I, you know, I've, I've, I remember just being horrified sometimes when artists were just kind of cold and uncool to, to certain radio people or just, you know, when they're meeting people in the industry and it's like, God, come on, really? Do I really need to, but that's part, that's an important part of the business. They, they tell a really uh, interesting story in here where she went to a, a radio station out in, in Riverside here in Southern California. Yeah. And, um, you know, and she did kind of a little, a little thing and she was very personable and it, it kind of, you know, it works and people remember that and they are gravitated towards you when you do stuff like that. One of her other successes is uh, mobilize your audience. And she was early to fostering her fan base online, first on MySpace, mm -hmm. remember MySpace, Jay, mm -hmm. then on Tumblr before Instagram and TikTok. The platform allowed her to serve her music to fans faster than radio would. Uh, again, the, Rick Barker said, when she saw people hanging out on MySpace, she looked at it like a venue. She was playing for thousands of fans every night. Yeah. And, you know, that's a super important thing to recognize is, you know, you're, you're always on stage and you're always performing when you're growing, whether you're meeting fans or people in the industry. It's super important to remember that. And people that will and never focus. forget that. Um, no. I know artists that reach out to their fans via social media from time to time and thank them for things that they've posted or will follow them or make comments. And those fans never forget that. And then they tell everybody about it. It's sort of like when you have the opportunity to meet an artist and let's say you get your photo taken with them, that's currency today. And you're going to post that on social media. You're going to put it at your cubicle and tell all your friends about it. And if you have a good experience, um, you're, you're going to drive traffic. You're, you're going to get more fans involved. And conversely, if you have a bad experience, which we all hear these stories, you know, of an artist that maybe, you know, uh, wasn't cool to a, a fan or a radio station or a staffer, they never forget that as well. Well, as your grandfather would have said, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And uh, as this article says, Swift's pioneering use of social media is now considered key to artist relationship with consumers. None other than Lucian Grange over at Universal said the way she uses technology to create an authentic connection with her fans has in many ways defined the modern music industry. Yeah, and I think you hit it on the head there with authentic 
because fans can smell inauthentic yes. a mile away and you can't yes. copy somebody else, whether it's style, you know, sound, or even the way that they post, you need to find your own true genuine voice because the fans can sense that. Right. And the next one was keep personal connections. And I couldn't agree more executives, radio pro programmers, and other business associates describe Taylor Swift's acute memory for detail about their spouses and their children and their dogs. And they say that they still have her handwritten thank you cards, right? And I remember this way back, like when I was working at Tower Records, we had the band, the Hooters come in and do an in-store mm -hmm. and they wrote us all personal thank you notes. I was in Nashville for an event with Reba McIntyre once. And I got home and not only did she send me her book, which was new at the time, but inside was a handwritten note. And she remembered things, you know, that we had talked about. And I just think that that is so important to have that personal uh, connection. And the last thing I'll say on that just really quickly, because I think this is really important is I work with a band right now that they keep a Google Doc uh, and they've been touring for 10 years. They keep a Google Doc of everybody they meet on the road, whether it's a club owner, a radio station, fan, whoever it is, who they are, where they are, um, what their dog's name is, what their birthday is, what, you know. And they do this really cool thing where they'll, if they're in, the, in their bus and they're touring and it's somebody's birthday, they'll get the phone out and they'll sing happy birthday to people and send it to them. And I'm telling you, it's... It's genuine, but it's also a really smart business move because when they go into these different towns, they reach back out. Hey, Mike, we're coming into Ojai, man. You know, we'd love to see you at the show. And, you know, it's just, it's really smart. And that's something Taylor Swift has been doing forever. Yeah, absolutely. The next one, as they mentioned, is stay fresh. And boy, that's so important. A key part of Swift's lasting power is a cultural force. She was referred to herself as a geriatric pop star. It's her success in reinventing herself, music executives say. None of the records are the same. The shows are never the same, said Rod Essex, Swift's agent in the early years. People keep interested. When she decided to release her first pure pop album, she took her fans with her. In what fans now call taylurking, she invited them to secret <laughs> sessions hosted at her various homes where she played unreleased songs from 1989. The album launched Swift into a new stratosphere of sales and fame. That is so smart. And it's also smart to evolve. If you look at all of our favorite artists, you know, starting with, you know, the Beatles, they, they've evolved. Each album is like a whole different, almost like a new band. And there's very few artists that do that. And I love the Ramones, but every record sounds the same, basically. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think for longevity, you know, especially for someone like Taylor Swift, uh, you know, it's, it's really smart. And the last one here is really knowing your leverage. You know, as sales surged weeks after the 2014 release of 1989, Taylor Swift pulled her entire catalog from Spotify. Remember that? She mm -hmm. had battled with the streaming giant ahead of her album's release, requesting that Spotify only make 1989 available to its paying subscribers, not on its free ad-supported tier. She said that valuable things should be paid for. Um, and she wrote that you know, for an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal. It's, this is her talking. It's my opinion that music should not be free. And my prediction is that individual artists and their labels will someday decide what an album's price point is. And I love that, that she's always been so outspoken, you know, on all of these issues. Yeah. Well, and the last one is really kind of almost could have just been the title of the, of the entire piece, which is Break Precedents. And it says, you know, in 2018, she signed a deal with Universal that gave her ownership of any music she records. Her first six albums remained with the independent label Big Machine, then were sold twice. She, having tried and failed to buy the rights to that music, she called the sale my worst case scenario and pledged to re-record her catalog as versions she would own. No other artist has re-recorded to the same extent and with the same success. Uh, she adds previously unreleased songs that didn't make the cut on the original albums, encouraging fans to buy the new versions. Yeah. And you know what? That that one thing right there, and the re-record thing has been in the business for well before, oh, yeah. since the beginning. Patsy Cline did and, it. 
Exactly. But it was always sort of a dirty little secret that was done off to the side. And a lot of times artists would maybe just re-record some of their hits for use in film and television so they could kind of capture all of that money. Mm -hmm. But to do it to the level she has done it is just been stunning. Unprecedented. And, you know, again, that is breaking precedence. And man, she is doing it and will continue to do it and it's a case study it's, it's fun to watch it's a case study and yeah, it's fun you know, to the watch. last thing i'll say on this is that the you're absolutely right it's unprecedented the re-recorded versions of fearless red those albums have outstreamed the original counterparts at a ratio of three to one that's wow. crazy you know her next re-recorded album is speak now taylor's version and uh, that just came out yesterday Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And my daughter informed me that it is out <laughs> because she was waiting for it. Amazing. You know, and it's, it She's is a force really of nature. Amazing. Yeah. And it's just really, uh, it's so nice to see her so empowered yeah. and to, you know, to, to, like you said, to kind of really bust a lot of myths and make a lot of just very calculated, but very sincere decisions mm-hmm. on how to move forward. And, boy, and uh, what, a, what a career. Uh, underestimate her at your own peril. At your own peril, exactly. Well, on that note, Jay and I are going to wrap up the show. We do want to thank everyone for listening in. We do not take it for granted. We want to thank our sponsors, the Music Business Association, HypeBot, and Bands in Town. And I want to thank my brother Jay for doing it every week. We are at episode 152. Hard to believe we've been doing it for coming up on three years. And uh, couldn't have done it without our audience. So thank you all for listening. And on that note, we will see you next time on the Your Morning Coffee Podcast. You've been listening to Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news program for the new music business. Join Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchard next time for the digital music news you need to know.